Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television with me, Frank Pereira. The deafening chance of four more years, U.S. President Barack Obama in his final address as president cautioned against everything that incoming President Donald Trump has publicly espoused, including anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-women, anti-gay, pro-Russian and pro-rich sentiments. As he ascended the stage in Chicago, the crowds roared, four more years, four more years. Even as Obama tried to quiet the very emotional gathering of people who had come to see off the man who finally avenged 9-11, made gay marriage legal and ensured health care for all Americans. While Obama can rightfully boast about a vastly improved economy and other changes during his tenure, the man who's taking his place in the Oval Office has promised to reverse much of what Obama accomplished. And while the president remains personally popular, his Democratic Party is weaker than it was eight years ago, reducing its chances of protecting Obama's legacy. On this edition of The Big Picture, we'll take a look at the hits and misses of Obama, the president. Joining me on the program today are Chintamani Mahapatra, Chairman, Center for Canadian, US and Latin American Studies, JNU, Suresh K. Goel, former ambassador, Kamar Aga, international affairs expert and senior journalist, and Alok Bansal, director, India Foundation. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Professor Mahapatra, I'd like to start with you, of course, and talk about the positives. You know, in 2008, when uh, President Obama took over as the president of the United States, the economy of the United States wasn't doing very well. Uh, he, uh, you know, ensured that he he, uh, he created jobs and he ensured there was a rebound or rebounds of the economy as such. And that definitely can be listed as one of the positives and one of the legacies of Obama. Quite right. And in fact, uh, when the American economy was moving into the recession, at that time it was a very big challenge for an African-American president to really say that he is going to set things right. And today, if you analyze a set of statistics, then continuously for 75 months, when the jobs were created positively, then Obama has something good to claim about it. And in fact, the overall American economy also has not slided down. Rather, it has become more stable than before. And compared to what is happening in Europe, in Japan, in Southeast Asia, American economy is OK. Having said that, it all depends how one looks at the statistics. Every time there is an American election, the economy is very, very important agenda item. And during this campaign also, when the Republican Party uh, candidates were repeatedly talking about the job losses, they're going to create new jobs. He's the one who is going to bring back manufacturing into the American economy. He's the one who is going to give priority to American jobs, American companies, American hands, American workers. That means what? That means the statistics always reveal half the truth. The other half is half done by the other side. So while Obama definitely can claim that the American economy is more stable than before, Donald Trump probably is going to argue that he is going to set things much better than what it has been now. Indeed, you know, as far as Donald Trump is concerned, Ambassador, at least the economy is being given to him on a platform unless, unlike what Obama inherited in 2008, isn't it? Because there is something for Donald Trump to build on now. Now he's promised a major tax overhaul. How much of that is really going to, um, how much of impact are we going to see from that? Uh, let me put it this way, first of all, that it's rather a pity that all this data about the growth in employment, the emerging from the recession, etc., etc., that all the data that uh, began to come out in the media happened more or less around the same time when the election campaign was on and uh, it appeared like uh, all this is happening basically because Obama is now leaving, his presidency is over, while actually the economic change turnover was more a result of the policies that Obama adopted in terms of uh, <clears throat> Uh, creating employment, inclusive policies, econo economy, uh, etc., etc. So yes, in that sense, Trump has the advantage of inheriting an economy which seems to be doing well as compared to what Obama had eight years ago. Uh, it's very going to be very, very difficult to forecast because the economic progress or the economic growth is not simply a matter of the domestic policies of a country. Now, we know it very well that the focus of Trump is going to be more uh, within USA. What the USA is all about is going to be more introvert, inward-looking policies. 
and with defying all trends of globalization. But how it actually impacts on the economy of USA is very, very difficult to forecast. I will not really dare do so. There are different ideas. I don't think it's going to be possible for Microsoft and Ford and the other companies of the USA to completely uh, just come back from wherever they are into the USA. It's, it's going to be impossible, really. Trump himself, yes, he will wind up his projects. Not wind up the projects, but at least he will not go into the newer projects because he's now the president. Indeed. But I don't think that he's going to be able to uh, uh, retract from the projects which have already they are taken off, really. So I don't think that inward-looking policies can really work in the panel, and I'm sure that as time goes by, Trump will have to look at the larger picture. Indeed, indeed. And see what the corporate interests are. So on the whole, looking at the, the, uh, the, the world uh, uh, indicators, the global indicators, uh, I think it's too early to say anything at all what Trump impact would be on. Sure, uh, sure. <laughs> you know, before we uh, widen the scope of the debate and bring in some of the other aspects of foreign policy, military, and, and you know, what Obama has done on those fronts, I want to stick to economy for just a couple of more minutes. Uh, Alok Bansal, as far as uh, Obama is concerned, he took some bold decisions in 2008. You know, the controversial auto rescue that he, he conducted was, was ridiculed by the Republicans and said that it was going to be a complete failure. But the impetus that the auto industry got as a result of Obama's intervention ensured that the auto industry survived and then later on did well in the years to come. So these were some of the bold steps that he did take and which, which were required at that point in time. Undoubtedly, I think... Uh as far as the economic and social issues are concerned, I think healthcare scheme uh, is the one which is actually on the firing line. Uh, Trump has been talking about it. I think uh, Obama presidency was marked by certain path breaking decisions. I think uh, when you're looking at domestic things, it was the healthcare. But it's on uh, international affairs that he took certain path breaking decisions. I think in the recent past, he was the first US president to talk about global zero, uh, thereby talking of complete elimination of nuclear weapons. I think in the recent past, I haven't heard any US president say so. So, however hypothetical it may have been, but he did talk of elimination of nuclear weapons, projecting them as weapons of... He successfully wound up the Iraq war, US involvement in Iraq, I think, and to that extent, one has to grant him credit. Uh, of course, his critiques find that uh, his actions in Syria were probably lackadaisical. He did not take bold initiative, but I think he was sensible that he did not get into the quagmire of the Syrian war as his allies in Europe wanted him to. And I think uh, later events have shown that, that by doing so, he would have only ended up helping IS or Al-Qaeda. Uh, of course, uh, other events uh, of his presidency, of course, path-breaking decisions or re-establishment uh, re of uh, diplomatic relations with Cuba. I think a generation of Americans grew up. No, I, I think we'll go into that in detail in just a bit. But, uh, you know, talking about something else that you raised about Iraq and uh, uh, Kamar Aga, as far as the troops and military is concerned, there were about 200,000 or 180,000 troops, uh, to, to be precise, when Obama became the president that were in Iraq and Afghanistan in that particular region. He ensured that, you know, all those troops were pulled out of, uh, of uh, West Asia. But then the critics say that as a result of that, that gave rise to the ISIS or Islamic State and that in turn destabilized the region. Yeah, that is true, you know. There are many factors. This is one of the factors, you know. Because the uh, problem was there already. Al-Qaeda was there in Iraq before that, you know. Al-Qaeda in Iraq, that was known. Then Al-Qaeda in the uh, Arabian Peninsula, they started calling. Then they, after the Obama, they started calling Ara Al-Qaeda uh, in um, the whole region, you know, Iraq and Levant, you know, ISS was created out of Al-Qaeda came out. That was the problem, you know, that was he has inherited there. And because of the war, you know, that has further worsened the situation over there. And ISS, a new form has taken place, you know, and ISS came into being, then sectarian conflict was there also, you know, because that was also going in. And ISS was part of it, you know, and basically, the, it was uh, the organization was created to fight with the growing Shia influence in that region, Arc of Shia, which was dubbed, that included Iran's influence or Iran, uh, Syria, Iraq, and part of uh, and Yemen. You know, this is uh, and and Lebanon. You know, so that was the thing. You see, what was happening at that time? The many regional powers in that area, they were using 
uh, these militant as a proxy in these countries to gain uh, influence over the region. You know, Pakistan, like Pakistan in this part of the Asia and South Asia and Central Asia, and the other Arab countries. You know, the oil producing monarchs, some of the monarchs in Arab countries. You know, they were using them uh, to to gain influence in Iraq or Syria. So there, there were a number of factors, you know. Yes, of course, many blamed, you know, Obama is responsible. Even if his troops would have been there, you know, these organizations would continue to operate in that. Country. Indeed. This is what I was. The biggest other important aspect of his, in the region, you know, in this region, was Iran deal. That was one of the Indeed. biggest move, you know, making a nuclear deal possible, you know. That was his uh, real. Otherwise, everybody was, you know, expecting a war is but, going but, to... But will Trump, uh, you know, carry on on that path? <laughs> and will the Iran nuclear deal remain to be what it is uh, remains to be seen? That is a question will, that will be answered in the near future. But yes, Ambassador, yeah. you wanted to make a point? Yes. Very, very briefly, uh, as somebody said that it's easy to start a war. But to stop the war and knowing when to end the war is the most difficult question. And the problem in both Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, you take any country in that area has been you know, that uh, the war was started basically either by USA or because of USA or because of the West. But they don't have an end game in sight. Afghanistan, the same thing happened. You have a civil government there. You had Karzai before. You have Ghani now. But uh, you, did, you did not take care of basically the reasons which were leading to all that tension in the area, all that internecine fights, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and then now uh, ISIL, ISIL has taken responsibility for the attacks in Kaniya Kabul. So you don't have solution to those things really. Uh, on the other, you kept on encouraging Taliban indirectly. You brought in several countries who actually had an interest in continuing with those elements to, uh, to, to work in uh, Afghanistan. Iraq, see what is happening there now really. So I think essentially the American policies in that area are a mixed bag, really speaking. Sure, sure. They have yes. not. Yes. Well, very, very quick point so that I can move on to other subjects. Yes, Mr. Raga. I, I just want to, I fully support uh, what Ambassador has just now mentioned. You know, the problem was policy of regime change. It doesn't work. He was able to topple the regime. Uh, Bush was able to topple the regime in Iraq, Afghanistan. And then, you know, during Barack Obama's time, you know, the regime was toppled in uh, Libya, but it, they were unable to form pro-West government. So they sure. have achieved only mm. half goal, you know. Indeed. If the regime would have been toppled by the local people in Iraq or other places, Libya or now Syria, you know, these things would have been taken care. I mean, these elements would have been, uh, we wouldn't have seen such elements to emerge. Yeah. Or, or even if they would have come, local people would have managed because, but, but the problem is, you know, Outside forces, they come and it was a big force, American, they were very successful in toppling Saddam Hussein and then, you know, the local, sure. I mean, the vacuum was uh, filled by these groups. Yes, you know. yes. I just support. wanted to say that it's a problematic affair when you generalize things. I think all four cases, to my mind, are quite different. In Yemen, there was no US role, actually. The problem was in Libya, where they actually went for a regime change mm. and created uh, unleashed instability. As far as Iraq is concerned, I think the colonial construct itself was artificial. And as and when, the, uh, there was bound to be a, actually a shake-up. And uh, when US withdrew, if you see, Iraq was relatively stable. Actually, they had managed to usher in a democratic regime in a region where democracy was an anathema. They ushered in, it was quite uh, stable, uh, it was working. Of course, there were other issues which came into play uh, because Iraq inherently was a, a, actually an artificial construct uh, cobbled up by the colonial masters and I think it had to unravel at some stage or something like that. Sure. As Fair far enough. as Syria is concerned, I think he showed a great deal of maturity in not jumping into the quagmire when France uh, uh, was specially urging US to move into it. There were a large number of people in the uh, US who were actually asking him. And as far as Afghanistan is concerned, uh, it was only his I think uh, the domestic pressure which wanted troops to come back, I think which led them to start cultivating Taliban to find a negotiated settlement so as to project to the people. 
Uh, of course, uh, one should not uh, deny him his great day that he managed to eliminate uh, Osama. Yes, yeah, Osama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Osama. fact must be. He, he avenged the killings of 9-11 and that's something that he was, you know, hailed for back home in the United States. But let's move on now from the military and talk about one of Obama's pet projects, Obamacare. Professor Mahapatra, you know, uh, Barack Obama has received immense criticism from Obamacare. Donald Trump even has gone on to say that he's vowed really to, to end Obamacare and bring in something new. Now, he's not given us details as to what this something new really is going to be. But is Obamacare going to be uh, uh, Barack Obama's Achilles heel really? <laughs> You know, it's always easy to criticize and more difficult to come up with a very credible plan. Healthcare debate has been going on in the United States for decades, and it was extremely difficult for successive American presidents uh, to uh, come up with a new plan and implement it. Hillary Clinton, uh, when she was uh, the first lady, she had a very ambitious healthcare plan, and that got bogged down in the American Congress and the American debate. For the first time in recent American history, an American president was able to come up with some plan which would help a large number of poor people to have some kind of affordable insurance policy. Now, critics are always there and they are criticizing. By and large, the Democrats are liberal people and the Republicans are conservative. The Democrats are by and large poor, uh, pro-poor and pro-working class. And the Republicans always support the big industry and the corporate America. Now, when Obama started his affordable health care program, at least 20 million poor people had some plan to buy and they have bought it already. Now, if you compare the health care you know, policy of the European countries, the Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries and the United States, the U.S. performance is pathetic. More than 40 million people don't even have any kind of uh, you know health insurance without having health insurance living in the united states is extremely difficult i can cite you a very old statistics now things could have been worse actually that every year 70000 people in the us die out of ordinary flu the old people simply because people can't afford an affordable health care plan that is insurance policy so donald trump who is by and large going to be you know, pro-America and a capitalist, himself is a businessman. Out of 21 odd people he has already nominated, most of them are elderly people, billionaires and white Americans. Whereas Obama, who happens to be one of the most credible democratic leaders, supportive of the uh, downtrodden and underprivileged, he has been able to come up with a plan. If the next administration is going to dismantle the whole thing, it is going to be bad for the American people and there is going to be a tremendous amount of resistance on that also. So I think that Obama did a good job and the policy has at least helped a large number of American people and any attempt to completely undo, undo it is going to be unfortunate for the American society. Indeed. You know, uh, Ambassador, let's uh, take the debate forward and let's talk about something else now. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, the foreign policy mm -hmm. as far as, uh, you know, uh, America has seen over the last eight years. One of the achievements, like we spoke about earlier, the Iran nuclear deal. Another achievement, the thaw in the relationship between Cuba yes. and, and the United States. That was something unprecedented. That was something that was never seen. So that clearly were some of the other achievements of Obama, weren't they? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I... You know, what I said about the policy in the Middle East and the Gulf, etc., etc., and I call it a mixed bag, I think Obama started with a great vision. I mean, you remember his speech in the Cairo University when he was visiting Egypt. There was great expectation that there is a, here is a great visionary. And he got the Nobel Prize, really, I mean, for, for the kind of vision he had in terms of establishing the, uh, bringing the world peace. But I think as he went along, the constraints of the real politic existing both in the USA and globally began to really restrict whatever his vision was. And therefore, if we look now at the end of eight years, and if we really make a balance sheet of the debits and credits, you can mention Cuba, yes. Uh, it happened just in the last year of his presidency, uh, great success. Iran happened 
in the last year of his presidency. I really wonder if he had been president for another two years. Where would Cuba and Iran gone? Where would have gone? Because as it is, even, even before the elections, we began to hear whispers about the problems in implementation of agreement with Iran. We began to hear some of the difficulties in terms of establishing the, you know, the migrations and the trade, etc., etc., despite all the efforts by, uh, by, by uh, Obama. I think in the other areas, we of course have a great deal to be satisfied about. But I suppose that we will talk about the bilateral relations uh, later in, in a larger uh, way, manner. We have a great deal to be happy about because Obama had a place, he called it the Asian pivot. Uh, 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 so we, we, for us, we were actually on the seventh cloud. Indeed. Uh, but I think if you look at the other areas, it's again a very, very mixed kind of a thing. Look at the Pacific. You have a great deal of uncertainty there with China really coming, becoming more active, asserting its claim in the South China Seas. And there was no credible answer, response from USA to what China was doing in the South China Seas. Pacific, USA was on the retreat. Uh, the TPP did not really get off. Uh, in Africa, again, uh, we, I, I cannot think of any great path-breaking achievement in Africa. Middle East, Gulf, etc. And if we talk about Iran, again, one implication of Iran is that the fulcrum of Arab politics, Saudi Arabia, got into complete doldrums. Yes. So essentially, you know, I mean, Russia. I mean, if you look at the whole, uh, we can talk in great detail about what happened in different areas. But it's again a very mixed kind of a thing. You there know, is a great one, vision. One, one more aspect of it, Alok yeah. Bansal, is the fact that Israel and U.S. relations also soured, yes. you know, towards the end. We saw Benjamin Netanyahu, in fact, openly yeah. criticizing Barack Obama. In fact, I think uh, one has to grant it. Uh, that's what I was trying to say, that Obama took certain path-breaking decisions. Mm -hmm. But it was difficult to wade through the American establishment to pursue. I think uh, his relations with Netanyahu was very, very strained. But it is only towards the end of his tenure that the U.S. abstained and a U.N. resolution could go through. Uh, because uh, all said and done... Can I interrupt? It happened basically because he was in the last stages and he knew no, that he maybe, could do it. Maybe, whatever it is. But <laughs> he, his commitment was there. I think the strain uh, between U.S. and Israel was for uh, everyone to see. I think the body language between the two leaders was for quite some time. He may not have been uh, because of the domestic uh, compulsions. He could not pursue. But Obama in principle was opposed to the policy of growing uh, Jewish settlements in West Bank and I think uh, which was actually negating the two nation uh, the principle completely mm -hmm. but uh, I think uh, on other fronts I think even on Afghanistan he came out with the policy but kept flip-flopping and I think to my mind I think the strength of a diplomat is that you should be able to make changes when required like he wanted to pull out all the troops by a particular date, then he realized it's not feasible. He wanted to go in for a negotiated settlement. He realized it's not feasible. So he could make that mis... Similarly with Iran, I think uh, there were so many times when you thought the talks would break, but it was actually his perseverance that... And because of this good relations with Iran, it gave him greater flexibility in the Middle East. The, the house of Al-Saud, which is to my mind today the epicenter of global terror, I think has come under immense pressure because of uh, two factors. One is of course the rapprochement with Iran and US becoming a net exporter of energy. I Indeed. think and mm -hmm. that's why US could uh, take a pragmatic decision and now Syria seems to be stabilizing. Uh, he provided active support in Iraq at some stage. Of course, one may argue that he could have done it earlier. He did it a little later. With Russia, yes. He did have problems, but even with China, it was blow hot, blow cold. But I think a certain level of equilibrium was maintained with China. I, I, I think China is going to get extremely serious in the near future <laughs> because of the kind of messages that Donald Trump has sent. Mr. Raga, you know, he has already questioned the one China policy. He has met, uh, he has telephoned the, uh, the, the premier of Taiwan. Also, the Taiwanese premier has, has visited the United States. So, I mean, that relationship certainly needs to be watched in the near future. That's true, you know. But, you know, he started, you know, towards the end, last two, three years, you know, he started talking, withdrawing from the uh, Middle East and giving emphasis to Asia Pivot, you know, that was basically, you know, the Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific he was talking, you know. 
and uh, of late you know he started dealing with the japan australia to contain growing you know chinese uh, ob chinese muscle flexing in the region so there are moves you know he was there and i hope you know the new president would take what i happen you know he is uh, a president uh, elect uh, has taken a very tough line I, I i can see professor mahapatra you know wants to come into the debate i've got very short time i mean i'm running out of time so i'd like you to have the last word on the program professor mahapatra go ahead please okay i just wanted to say something on china the chinese initially were really happy and they they wished that if uh, if donald trump would come to power that would be good for them because donald donald said that uh, he is not going to underwrite the security of the japanese and the south koreans if they want they can make the bomb and fend for themselves and he opposed the tpp so the chinese thought that he is going to put less strategic pressure on china and china could have the ball game in the whole of asia pacific but the moment he becomes president elect from a presidential candidate and he talks to the taiwanese president he raises the issue about uh, taxation on the imported chinese goods he challenges the currency policy of china then chinese are really concerned worried in times to come i can confidently say that tremendous amount of gold confrontation is going to go on between china and the usa particularly in south china sea where an underwater um, uh, you know craft of the americans which was you know, doing some surveillance work was captured by the chinese and the way donald trump behaved earlier when it was the ep3 incident george bush was the president newly president in april i think uh, that incident took place a few months after he assumed the presidency the chinese arrested about 24 americans put them behind the bars for 11 days demanded an apology and got it also dismantled that particular american aircraft and that was a humiliation for america but this time donald trump said you have captured our craft keep it so the way donald trump is behaving towards china the chinese government doesn't know how to how to manage this guy so in times to come it is going to be difficult days in the asia pacific between the emerging superpower and the existing superpower which sure. is trying to stop his decline and make america great again indeed indeed all right yes ambassador quick china, point because i think there is a lot of grandstanding here from trump on china trump is driven basically by the economic interests of the usa and he soon going to realize that without china being a partner in that economic relationship those are interests are going to be affected so it's a hard lesson that is a hard to learn, lesson i think okay. given give two years and he will be yes. all right but but donald trump the uh, the the president elect and donald trump the candidate are two different people and he, <laughs> uh, two different people and on that note i'm going to have to call it a wrap on this edition of the big picture chintamani mahapatra suresh k goel kamar aga and alok pansal thank you so much gentlemen for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us that's all the time we have on this edition of the big picture thank you so much for watching